Coming up in today's newscast, new reports reveal a secret meeting between Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu and Egyptian President Sisi. Israeli tourists are beaten by police in Romania, and two Israeli swimmers just took gold at the 2018 World Para-European Championships. New reports by Israel's Channel 10 News are now alleging that Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu and Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi held a secret meeting in May to discuss a ceasefire with Gaza. According to the report, unnamed American officials confirmed that on May 22nd, Netanyahu and a small delegation flew to Cairo to break the Ramadan fast, discuss the topics at hand, and then return to Jerusalem a few hours later. This is not the first time that the two leaders have reportedly met in secret, and they met publicly for the first time in September of 2017. But there were a few interesting revelations about this particular meeting. First, apart from discussing easing the blockade around Gaza and advancing humanitarian aid, several of the members of the Israeli delegation, including guards and advisors, were previously unaware of the meeting. Second, President Sisi apparently insisted that the PA must take control over Gaza even if it meant a gradual transition and that Hamas may retain some or all of its military might. And third, that Prime Minister Netanyahu, contrary to public opinion, did indeed stress that the two Israeli citizens and two bodies held by Hamas be returned. But the Prime Minister's office has declined to either confirm or deny the meeting at all, let alone what was discussed. Now this meeting was held two and a half months ago, but there hasn't really been any public changes to the situation. In fact, both government and public opinions are now at their most skeptical. A new poll jointly conducted by the director of the Palestinian Center for Policy and Survey Research in Ramallah, Dr. Khalil Shikaki, and Dr. Dalia Scheindlin from the Center for Peace Research at Tel Aviv University, found that only 49% of Israelis and 43% of Palestinians across all demographics supported the idea of a two-state solution. Further, 56% of Palestinians and 47% of Israeli Jews didn't even think the two-state solution was a viable option. And as the violence over the Israel-Gaza border now enters its sixth month, Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman also says that the next major flare-up wasn't a matter of if, but when. Despite fears that the newly passed nation-state law would result in housing discrimination, the Israeli government on Monday approved the construction of several new towns for the Bedouin and disabled populations in the periphery. The new towns approved by the housing cabinet are located primarily in the Negev and in the Galilee. New housing is now earmarked for the communities of Irovot, Daniel, Nitzanit, and Shibolet. The housing cabinet, which is headed by Finance Minister Moshe Kachlon, viewed these four areas as an exception to the preference to refrain from constructing new communities. Rather, the current policy, as dictated by the National Board for Planning and Building, prefers to build up existing communities. Still, according to this new plan, the four new communities in the Negev and the Galilee will now be outfitted with hundreds more housing units and basic infrastructure. What's more is that in 20% of the housing units in Shibolet and Daniel, which are getting 350 and 500 units respectively, are to go to people with disabilities. Then in Irovot, the 500 additional units slated to be built there will help the Bedouin population move into a permanent location. This is in addition to the several small Bedouin homes and communities in the Negev that were legalized last year. The worried criticisms of the nation-state law have now again spread to the Jewish diaspora, with World Jewish Congress President Ron Lauder writing a second op-ed about how Israeli policies pose the greatest threat to the future of the Jewish people. In the op-ed, which was published Monday to the New York Times, the Jewish billionaire and advocate listed such examples as the failure to construct an egalitarian prayer space at the Western Wall, restrictions on conversion laws, the recently passed surrogacy bill, which excludes single men, the detaining of Orthodox Rabbi Dov Chayun last month, and of course, the new nation-state law. Well, here with more on these issues, the former head of the Office of the Chief Rabbi of Israel, Do Rabbi Dov Halbertal, and former Israeli ambassador to multiple countries, Yosef Livni. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having us. Um, appreciate it. Uh, now, so my first question is, can the divide between Jews of the diaspora and Jews of Israel be patched? Because right now it's, it seems to be growing. Uh, Rabbi Halbert, tell us about I think so. We love the, the, the Jewish in the diaspora. We respect them. And we are thankful for everything they are doing for the state. And they, they are doing a lot. On the other hand, they have to respect us. Our sovereignty, our values, and they have to know one very crucial thing. 
If they want to influence, let them come here. They cannot sit there and they ask question about the national law or the Western wall, the Kotel or something like this. We are a demo democratic place. They have to know that the citizens who are here in the state, they decide and they sitting there in Miami Beach, in Washington, they cannot decide for us and they have to support us without any condition. Well, but that's the well, but that's the thing, you know, if you're talking about people supporting us, which often, you know, boils down to financial support from the United not States. Only, not only, not but not only, but it yeah. often often boils down to to financial support and if we're talking about lobbying, financial support or any other type of material support for the country of Israel, wouldn't you expect them to be in support of the policies here? Why would they support policies that they disagree with? They don't they don't have to support policies. They don't want to interfere in, in those questions. They have to support the state of Israel without any condition in every government. I personally, I don't like Netanyahu. I, lo I don't. I'm against the national law very firmly. On the other, I wouldn't go mm -hmm. to the states and declare it. There are right, you know, all kinds of uh, articles about it. Uh, they have to back us, to back us sir. without any condition. Then we will be united. Uh, I, have, I have a different perspective on the issue. Look, when I was Deputy Consul General in New York, I remember uh, one of my uh, contacts said, if you want us at the landing, we want to be with you when you take off. What do I mean by that? The American Jewish world, and I don't use the word community because when you have five million people, these are, this is not a community. This is a whole world. They are a strategic asset of the state of Israel. They go and they fight for us. They go and support us in those issues that are crucial to our livelihood, to our security, etc. What they're saying is we as a nation are moving towards one direction and we are creating a void between them and us. I think it's their right to express their views. I think that if we expect them to go and support us, go, as they say in baseball, go, to, go mm -hmm. with a bat, right? Sure for the state of Israel, I think they have every right to express their opinion. In many issues, I see eye to eye with them. Mm. I think that if we keep uh, opening this gap between them and us, those who will pay for it will be us. All right, so uh, I'd like to actually kind of read uh, an excerpt from Ron Lauder's uh, uh, op-ed, which is very pertinent to what we're talking about. Tragically, the new policies will not strengthen Israel, but weaken it, and in the long run, they may endanger Israel's social cohesiveness, uh, economic success, and international standing. But the greatest threat to the future of the Jewish people for over 2,000 years, modern Judaism, has aligned itself with enlightenment. The Jews of the new era have fused our national pride with religious affiliation with the dedication to human progress uh, and worldly cultural morality. Conservatives and liberals, we all believe in a just Zionism and a pluralistic Judaism that respects every human being. So when members of the Israel uh, government unintentionally undermine the covenant between Judaism and enlightenment, they crush the core of contemporary Jewish existence. How would you respond to that? That's not fair. You know, it's not fair. You have to know they are three millions may be liberals and reformed during the states. Well, but so that's actually another point, point that no, he no, brings up. If you talk about the whole of the Jewish world, I'm including going, Israel and the diaspora, the vast majority are not ultra-Orthodox. No, 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 but it's not true. You see here, you see here in the elections, you see in the coalition, they are the majority. If not, there, there weren't any problems with the Kotel, with the Western world, any problems with the, all the, the gays and all those things. If they want, they have to understand it very deeply. If they want to really influence, why aren't they coming? You know, three million reforms and liberals coming here, they change everything. They will have whatever they want. They cannot sit there and they impose on me, on us here, their values. Well, but the vice, but the I don't interfere in their things. But the thing is, I think this is where we uh, descend from each other. The point is, 
I am not an Orthodox Jew. I do not accept the rabbinical authority. I do not see them as representing me. I am a liberal Jew. Mm. In the United States, every stream or every current of Judaism is legitimate. Mm -hmm. I think it is within their rights to say, hey, wait a minute. Why is it that in Israel, a conservative rabbi is taken to police station at five o'clock in the morning mm. for what? For conducting marriage. I think that, at least in my view, I think Israel should expect, should accept the fact that there are people here who are just as Jewish as the people who are consider themselves Orthodox, but who express their Judaism in a different manner. Mm. So it's not a question of they are sitting there and they are telling sure. us what to do. What they're saying is, give our brethren who live in Israel the same rights that others have, that the Orthodox sure. have, or that Orthodox have in the United States where they're a minority. So I'd like no? to bring it back to you, because you, you mentioned earlier, you know, about the United States Jews and Jews in diaspora who should respect the yeah. laws of Israel regardless. Yeah. But here in Israel, going off of uh, Ambassador Livni's point, if we have, even, even if the majority were ultra-Orthodox, which I don't believe that the numbers support that, but even if, even if that were true, if you had 30, 40 percent of the Jews who were secular, would you know? Wouldn't it be respectful? Wouldn't it? Isn't it just to offer them, you know, the equal benefits as a Jew? Of course, of course. We cannot. I don't think that uh, as an ultra orthodox, I will impose on somebody on on the ambassador my values. Not at all. Well, but isn't he that is what doing privately doing whatever they, he wants. But privately. isn't that what a lot of these he laws that we just said earlier? I, isn't that, that what the debate is not is not this. The debate is on the publicity of the states, how it looks like the Jewish state. That is the debate. In this debate, we, is the Orthodox, are the majority the Jewish, Is the Jewish state the state of all the Jewish people or just the people living in Israel? The Jew, we respect and we love all the Jewish people. What I'm saying is like this. They can abroad criticize me. They can. They have the all right to do it. But they have to support me. They cannot threat in disconnecting the connections because it starts with the reforms, with the liberal and with the Western world. It will finish mm. with the agreement in Gaza. Tomorrow he will say, like, like the national law, he will, say, he will tell us, mm. if you don't come to agreement with the Palestinians and give them Yerushalayim, we will disconnect the connections. Is that, is that, is that a fair? It's, well, it's think, a fair thing. What do you well, think about it? They can, no, they can I, think say, a, I think there's a different... A huge difference okay. between the political issue and something which is not political. Mm. It is something that has to do with deeply rooted values mm. and something which is written in the Declaration of Independence. Freedom of conscience, freedom of, of religion. That, what they're saying is, what, what well, mean? Uh, in, they in the it. state, oh, publicly, publicly, the public arena in Israel should be open right. for all Jews, okay. whether be the reform, conservative. So let them come. They are not coming. They Unfortunately, not with coming. that, we have to we have to end it. Uh, uh, I apologize, but Ambassador Livni, Rabbi Halbertal, thank you both very much for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now, five suspects, including a senior Israeli rabbinate official from the Kashult Inspection Branch, have just been arrested, according to police, for allegedly giving and accepting money from food importing companies. The rabbinate official, specifically, was arrested for accepting, quote, on a large number of occasions, bribes and other benefits in exchange for benefits he illegally gave to others as part of his duties, end quote. After raiding suspects' homes, hundreds of thousands of shekels in cash were found, and eight others were questioned in regards to the investigation, but not arrested. The investigation was a cooperative one between the Lahav 433 Anti-Corruption Unit and the police, the Israeli Tax Authority, and Economic Crimes Division of the State Prosecutor's Office. Further, police insist that no non-kosher foods were imported and sold as kosher in Israel. Rather, just the approval process was slowed or expedited based on whether or not companies or individuals paid up somehow. Now, while an unnamed rabbinate official harshly denounced the suspects, a statement issued by the rabbinate's office to the media defended the suspected official, calling him dedicated and professional, and that while the rabbinate trusts the law enforcement agencies, they hope the conclusion will be innocence. 
In other alleged corruption news, two Israeli policemen have just been indicted for stealing hundreds of thousands of shekels from migrant workers in Tel Aviv who couldn't open bank accounts. According to the indictment, the two officers, Bisan Yaya and Nazia Saab, are accused of at least three different incidents. First, while apparently in uniform and armed, they held up a Chinese migrant worker's gambling operation for money, saying they'd shut the operation down unless they paid. Over a supposed 18-month period, the police took from just one Chinese migrant worker roughly four to 7,000 shekels per month. In the other two incidents, the same officers apparently entered an apartment without a warrant in South Tel Aviv's Neve Shannon Street, and they stole 8,000 shekels from the migrants living there. They later held up another apartment on Levinsky Street just a block south. There, they stole nearly 320,000 shekels and $8,000 from mainly Nepalese and Indian migrant workers who couldn't open bank accounts in the country. Then the next day, when one of the witnesses showed up at the police station to file a complaint, Officer Yaya filed a false report about the incident. The two officers' remand was extended until today. The Israeli embassy in Bucharest is now protesting against the Romanian government after riot police allegedly removed two Israeli tourists and their driver from their taxi and beat them. The incident occurred during the three-day protests in Romania's capital that started Friday in Victory Square. Roughly 100,000 people were estimated to be at the protests calling for an end to corruption in the government and for new elections. Even thousands of expatriates supposedly returned just to participate in the demonstrations. Unfortunately, according to Romania Insider News, hundreds of people were injured by riot police who used, quote, unprecedented violence to clear the area. Tear gas, smoke grenades, water cannons, and more were turned on the crowds, who shouted slogans, waved flags, and held up lit cell phone screens, an act now synonymous with the anti-corruption protests in the country. Some 500 people were injured. And that included on Friday night, when the protests first began, two Israeli tourists in the country who were just on their way back to their hotel when they were ambushed. According to the Israeli embassy, the attack was unacceptable and extremely serious. They were dragged out of their car, even though they showed their passports and explained that they had nothing to do with the protests. Footage of the incident was broadcast Monday night, and Romanian President Johannes already denounced the actions of police against demonstrators. Still, the two Israeli men will reportedly file a criminal complaint, and it seems as though the Israeli government will back them. Have you ever tried your hand at gardening only to find out that your thumb is very not green? And do you also happen to enjoy the benefits of cannabis? Well, if you answered yes to either or both of these questions, then listen up. Joining me right now in the studio, I'm very excited, is Uri Zevi, the CMO and co-founder of CEDO. Thank you so much for coming in today. Uh, all right, so tell me, what does the CEDO do? So CEDO is actually the first automatic growing device for any type of herbs, including cannabis. Okay. It is managed and controlled by a artificial intelligence software that runs the process of the growth from seed to harvest. And what it does, it actually provides the ultimate conditions for the plant, so the results are maximized. The, quant the quality of the end results are amazing. And I see here it's like the size of like a mini fridge. That's correct. So it can fit like living room, a laundry room, sure. garage. And so it takes soil or it's... No, it's hydroponic. Wow. Basically what, you do, what you, the customer needs to do is to put the seed inside the sidu, close mm -hmm. the door. There's a phone app that you choose the growing, the specific growing plan you want. Once you click play, you're done with your job. Sido will take care of everything for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So you mentioned that this was really for any herbs. Was it was it kind of designed with cannabis in, in mind, though, or was it designed with anything and everything? It was designed for any type of herbs. As okay. I told you, it creates the ultimate right. condition for the plant. But apparently, due to the prices of cannabis, sure. it's much more efficient to grow a cannabis in this uh, in situ. This would be, so this would be, is this more efficient just for home use or is this more efficient, like, can this be expanded to be a major grow? That's a good question. Basically, we can apply the same technology of SIDU to larger quantities yeah. growing in a commercial uh, containers or in grow rooms. This wow. is the next thing in uh, Farmers 2020. Yeah, this is, this is automatic <laughs> farmers and, and everything. That's amazing. So, okay, <laughs> how... First, how do we get our hands on, on uh, a CDU? Um, actually, you just go log into our website, which is sidulab.com, mm -hmm. which is S-E-E-D-O. And it's, it's available for order already? 
Um, you know, it's interesting that you're asking because so far we've been in pre-order, and mm -hmm. by the end of the month we will ship the first uh, the first shipment. Wow. So from end of the month on, it's available for order. And this is and it's available worldwide. Yes, worldwide, correct. Incredible. All right, well, uh, I'm going. I'm, I'm getting on the website immediately. Uli Zevi, thank you so much for coming. Thank here. you so much. It's a pleasure to have you. Thanks. Now, we all know the statistics that our plastic waste, rapidly rising in quantity, will outnumber fish in the oceans by 2050. But could jellyfish solve the world's plastic problem? Israel's Haifa University seems to think so, as researchers from the university have been working alongside international researchers to find a new solution to help minimize plastic waste in the seawater, known as microplastics. And they're doing it using jellyfish. Oddly enough, two of Israel's biggest summer nuisances are in fact jellyfish and plastic. Jellyfish usually swarm the seas in July, as rubbish and plastic debris also mount up in the summer months. In fact, plastic debris amounts to a staggering 92% of waste found in Israel's seawaters, up from the global average of 75%. While Dr. Joel Engel from Haifa University is leading a new team to isolate microplastics in the sea and ocean water by creating a filter made of jellyfish mucus. Jellyfish in the Mediterranean produce an unusually large amount of mucus, which Angel says is promising for the development of the future filter. The research is part of the Go Jelly Project, a group of people from fishing, tech, science, and research backgrounds, which promotes jellyfish as a new solution to microplastic pollution, and it's funded by the EU's Horizon 2020. While the project has begun by gathering plastic particles for testing, the second part involves removing a large number of jellyfish from the sea. So good news. This test may not only end up cleaning our oceans, it may also mean a less stingy summer for beachgoers in Israel. Two Israeli swimmers at the 2018 World Para-European Championships have just walked away with gold medals. 31-year-old Inbal Pizarro finished the 200-meter freestyle in just under 2 minutes and 55 seconds, while 17-year-old Ami Dadon finished the 100-meter freestyle with a new personal record of 1 minute and 25 seconds. Culture and Sports Minister Miri Regev has already tweeted out her congratulations to the pair of athletes, writing, quote, You have brought honor to the state of Israel. Though it's not the first time that the two took home top prizes. The wheelchair-bound Dadaon was competing this time in his first men's European championships. But last year he was one of the many Israeli teens to compete at the European Para Youth Games in Italy. He took home two medals. As for Pizarro, who's been paralyzed in her lower limb since birth, She's been a regular representative of Israel at international competitions. She's been going to the Paralympic Games since 2004, where she won four silver medals and five bronze ones, and she also took three gold, six silver, and one bronze medal from other world competitions, starting as far back as 2002. Now, while the news of these two winners comes as a great moment of pride, it's bittersweet, being announced at the heels of runner Lona Chemtai Salpeter's devastating mistake at the European Athletics Championships. Salpeter miscounted the number of laps and stopped running too soon during the 5,000-meter contest. She finished in fourth rather than in a solid second because of that mistake. And that was just a week after Salpeter took Israel's first-ever gold medal at the 10,000-meter race. But when talking about the race afterwards, Salpeter remained positive. In a video interview with Ynet News, she brushed off the incident, saying, What can I do? I can't bring it back. And that either way, she feels good and just needs to focus on her future. The Hebrew Word of the Day is brought to you by IDC Samru Ulpan, open to everyone. And now for our Hebrew Word of the Day, grow them, harvest them, or simply just appreciate them. Today's word is tzemach, meaning plant. Now we all know that tzmachim, or plants, eat up carbon dioxide and spit out oxygen for us to breathe, but I bet there are some really cool facts about tzmachim, or plants, that you didn't know. For example, did you know that 85% of all chayi tzemach, or plant life, exists in the oceans and not on land? Or how about how the rose family of tzmachim, or plants, includes apples, peaches, pears, apricots, quinces, and strawberries. In fact, it turns out that us humans turn around 2,000 different types of tzmachim, or plants, into our food. Though there are well over 300,000 known tzmachim on the planet. So, which tzemach is, is your favorite? There are a lot to choose from. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight should be partly cloudy and warm with a low of 77 or 25 degrees Celsius. Then tomorrow we'll likely have clear sunny skies and no change in temperatures. The high will be around 88 or 31 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.7 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV and don't forget to follow us on Facebook at Israel English News and on Twitter at ILTV News. I'm Aaron Porras. Thank you for watching.